Tag, meine Freunde, und willkommen to the early 1980s and an amazing week, the week ending 26th of December, 1981. At number 10, the Rolling Stones have had 17 top 10 singles and six number ones in Australia. Start Me Up was the last number one and the second to last top ten. The last was the underrated Harlem Shuffle, which was dropping down from the number one spot it held for two weeks in mid-November. One of their most popular songs, if not at the same standard as some of their previous classics, Start Me Up hung around the charts until mid-February 1982, racking up 21 weeks on the charts in all. Another X number one coming down the charts was Olivia Newton-John's Physical, which had replaced Start Me Up in the top spot and spent the last two weeks of November and the first week of December there. The record did even better in the USA, where it spent 10 weeks on top of the charts. Only the second song in history to do that after Debbie Boone's egregious You Light Up My Life. Not bad for a song which was originally intended for Rod Stewart. 8. Duran Duran made an exciting debut on the charts in 1981 with two top tens, Careless Memories and Girls on Film, which this week moved up two places eventually to reach number seven. Perhaps most famous for its racy video, there are few songs as evocative of the early days of the MTV generation than this. In at seven, a real curiosity, Johnny Warman's Screaming Jets, which features Peter Gabriel's backing vocals so prominently that it is, to all intents and purposes, a Peter Gabriel record, especially given the arrangement, which is, to say the least, Gabriel-esque. It was Warman's only hit ever, anywhere, although he has written the odd successful track here and there, especially to his good friend Ringo Starr. Number six. Kim Wilde was for a time the biggest selling British female artist there ever was, toppling Dusty Springfield from the summit and since surpassed by the Spice Girls, Shirley Bassey and Adele. Wilde had three top ten hits in 1981 and only one after that, the number one version of You Keep Me Hanging On, written by Holland Dozier and Holland. Cambodia was the least of the three hits, Kids in America and Checkered Love, the far superior other two, but for the time it did reinforce that thought that a major new talent was afoot in the top 40. A feast of fantastic facts follows forth within Fowl's fantastic world of facts. The biggest riser on this week's chart is Dave Stewart and Barbara Gaston's version of It's My Party, which bounded up from 38 to 21 on its way to a peak of number four. That's not the same Dave Stewart as was in the Arrhythmics. For every riser, there is a faller, and the biggest this week was Kiss, whose The Oath from the rather undervalued The Elder album fell eight places from 25 to 33. Having reached number 24, Kiss, who just a year ago had absolutely stormed the country, only had two more top 40 hits after this. The emeritus record on the chart was Urgent by Foreigner, which was in for 17 weeks at this point. The highest debuting single this week was the only debutante this week at number 38, which was Waiting for a Girl Like You, oddly by Foreigner, and was one place higher than Urgent. So the shortest running record on the charts was one place better than the longest running record on the chart. In the USA, the number one hit was Physical, while in the land of cricket and tea on summer lawns, it was the impossibly cheesy Save Your Love by Renee and Renato. It was kind of crap and only made number 55 here in Australia. The number one album about town was Business As Usual by Men At Work. This record has sold an almost inconceivable 10 million copies worldwide. I can't find a site for what the biggest selling albums by Australian artists are, but this would have to be in the the highest group of album sales. 10 million is just enormous. Number five, Tainted Love by Soft Cell is one of the most popular singles of all time, reaching number one in the UK, number one in Australia for three weeks from the end of February 1982, and despite only making number eight in the US, spending a then record 43 weeks in the Hot 100. 
The 1964 original of this single was recorded by Gloria Jones, who was the woman at the wheel of the car that crashed, killing rock god Mark Boland in 1977. Number 4. Rod Stewart went off the rails a little in the early 80s. He still had hits and all, but since 1978's Do You Think I'm Sexy, he'd become increasingly lightweight and self-parodic, not that he's ever taken himself too terribly seriously. But the front cover of his Tonight I'm Yours, the title track of which made it to number three, Say It All. While the single and its follow-up Young Turks were just brainless dance fluff, there are ample reminders of just how good Stuart really is on that album. Never Give Up On A Dream, a cracking version of Ace's How Long, and a sensitive run at Bob Dylan's Just Like A Woman. At number three, it's the Go-Go's with their fantastic Our Lips Are Sealed. The first of their two terrific top 40 hits, Vacation, the third hit actually stalled at number 43. This hit number one in the first weeks of 1982, while it was still falling out of the national charts. If you can find the original recording, it's even better with its edgy, punkier sound. A great little band that should have had a lot more hits. At number two for the second week is the previous number one, Down Under by Men at Work. It spent only one week at the top, replacing physical, but it topped the charts in New Zealand, Canada, and for a month in the US. The song does, however, have an element of tragedy to it, having been embroiled in an imbroglio over the alleged use of a melody from a children's song of the 1930s. It all started innocently enough, but was triggered 25 years after the record's release, when a question was asked on a local music quiz about it. This caused some music industry lawyer to prick up his ears, and a lawsuit was launched. The upshot was twofold. The judge awarded the plaintiff 5% of the royalties rather than the 60% they wanted, which still would have been a fair chunk of change, but more terribly. Greg Hand, who played the offending flute riff, became inconsolably depressed tore up over the fact that he felt no one would ever remember anything he did apart from lifting a riff. The band had incorrectly assumed the song was in the public domain, and given the fact it took 25 years for the copyright owner to make a claim, and had the quiz show not asked the question, may be uncontested to this day. But Ham went into a terrible downward spiral and died of a heroin overdose in April 2012. Ham's death triggered a vast wave of sympathy towards the band's legacy and outrage at the way they'd been treated, culminating for me with Colin Hayes set at Byron Bay in 2019, where 10,000 people sang along to his 10-minute encore of Down Under. It was a triumphant moment and, to my mind, vindicated Greg Ham. What song is mighty enough to crown this Cadillac of weeks? Only one man knows, and that man is a monkey, but give it 10 million years of evolution and we'll see. Go Monty, whack those skins! It's Cliff Richard. With his umpteenth number one single, Wired for Sound was an anthem for the emerging Walkman age. It's first-rate Cliff Pop. Cliff's never had the greatest range, but he does have that warm, slightly quavery tenor, and he knows how to convey a lyric. In this case, a lyric of joy and freedom and celebration of a future which has set us free to roller skate around a shopping mall. And what a week that was. For possibly the first time in our little series, a top 10 where every song can be listened to for nothing but pure enjoyment. What great days they were. If you weren't around then, take your humble narrator's word for it. The past despite being a foreign country, sometimes had charms that these days we take for granted. We'll talk again soon. <laughs>